Hi, I'm Rick Watson. Thanks for joining me on this episode of RPAS TV. Today we'll be talking to Jerry Grayson, who is an ex RAF helicopter pilot and author. He has also made the leap into the world of drones. Well, thanks so much for joining me, Jerry. Um, for the viewers who aren't familiar with you, just give me a little bit about your background. I've spent uh, most of my life with a helicopter strapped to my back, um, and uh, initially in the Navy, eight years uh, flying first anti-submarine and then search and rescue. And then I started a helicopter company down in Cornwall in the southwest of the UK and uh, ran that for 10 years and then started my own company doing entirely uh, film work from helicopters and that continued up until about uh, 2015 uh, and then of course the drones took over. You, you mentioned about the books and that's where I, I got to know you through. Um, so we have the rescue pilot which was the first one and then we have the film pilot. Just tell me a little bit about those. I mean uh, it, it appeared to me reading the books some of the stories that were coming back to you um, were pretty hard to bring back. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. I, I um, the first one, Rescue Pilot, I set out to sort of put stuff down on paper before I got senile and forgot it, um, and uh, kind of wrote it for the kids, really. Um, uh, you know, it was a time that they were too young or not around at all to, uh, to remember it. And... Um, and I found it remarkable that once you start applying uh, stories of aviation to paper and you know, stories you've lived through yourself, that you have total recall. Uh, and of course, as, as aviators, we have the, uh, uh, the plus side of having a, a log book that we keep. And um, so I found that I only had to read that, that one line in the, in the log book and, and I was right back there even though in some cases it was you know just 35 40 years ago and uh and i really enjoyed the process and and i would pick it up and put it down and um do it for a you know a few weeks here and there and then other things would attract my attention and then one day my daughter who by then was about 16 years old picked it up uh, the half completed manuscript and said dad you've got to finish this and i said well okay i'll finish it if you do the first edit and, uh, and we made that pact and uh, got to the point of um, uh, what we thought was a, a finished product. And then um, uh, my wife uh, achieved a publisher for me, which is uh, Bloomsbury. And um, they, uh, they are the people who, uh, who, who published um, a little known author with her story about a, a, a Scottish schoolboy who was a wizard. Um, <laughs> and uh, that made that company. And um, uh, by the way, that's about the only way to make money out of books. You get $1.83 out of the $30 uh, cover price. But um, uh, that was wonderful. And they gave me a professional editor who was uh, Jeffrey Archer's editor. I said, you can do whatever you like to my books if you're going to make me money like that. Um, but uh, no, that, that hasn't happened. But the, the Rescue Pilot was a real labor of love and, and and remembering things for my own sake and for the sake of the kids so i was i was really pleasantly surprised that it, it turned out to be a book that um that people enjoyed and our lives sort of took a very similar turn i i too was a helicopter pilot um went to fixed wing and i've been an instructor uh flight instructor for the last six years um but i've just moved into the drone world which is what you did as well what prompted you into the area Oof, uh, needs must almost. Um, look, I uh, when I stopped flying military and started flying civilian, I very quickly got into uh, doing um, film work with helicopters, and I hugely enjoyed the fact that you know it was a given that you could get yourself safely from A to B and back again, and you know take off at the beginning and land at the end, and hopefully you have the same number takeoffs and landings in your logbook throughout your career. Um, but uh, the thing that really turned me on was, was, was finding that I could use that skill to create a product. And that product um, was the, the five minutes in that one hour of flying uh, within which you were creating um, something that you could watch and you could show to somebody else.
and that contributed, albeit in a very small part, to, uh, uh, to, to somebody else's product. So, for example, you know, my very first movie was, was James Bond, You Good Kill, um, which was something of, you know, baptism by fire. Uh, but suddenly you find yourself with <clears throat> um, hundreds and sometimes thousands of other professionals who are all trying to, to, to do the same thing, which is make a great film, and, and using each of their little compartmentalized skills to contribute towards that. I found that hugely satisfying, and that was then a thread all the way through my uh, through my flying career, and uh, my helicopter flying career, and then, you know, I I started doing a bit of directing. Uh, uh, eventually, we in 2013 we produced our own IMAX movie called The Earth Wings, uh, which was um, a, a, a collection that we had built up over the years of significant moments things like you know hurricane katrina over new orleans and and um you know the black saturday bushfires down here and so on and um always there was this this feeling of i, I i'm using a career skill to generate something a product and after we'd done the imax film which took a couple of years of really head down concentration uh we came up for it for air and went uh, hang on a minute, where did, where did all the helicopter work go to? Uh, and that's when we realised that the drones had taken over. And we probably should have seen it coming, but uh, for so many years, um, the, the guys trying to film from model helicopters had gone, oh, we can do this, that and the other, and in the end, they couldn't. Not ever did they do it. And uh, so it was like, yeah, 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 we've heard this story before. Um, but of course, the, the genius of whoever it was that said, look, let, let's put um, uh, 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 rotors at the four corners and s operate them electrically and simply change the speed at which they rotate, uh, found an elegant simplicity that meant that they weren't model helicopters anymore uh, and meant that actually they were a tool that um, had pretty much taken over great swathes of uh, helicopter work long before we even realized it. So at that point, um, I was regularly throwing my shoes at the TV every time a commercial appeared with a, with a, a drone shot in it. Um, and uh, one day my wife, who is also my, my film producer, said, um, look, surely we have something to contribute to this. And I said, look, I, I really don't want to wear a baseball bat um, cap backwards and compete with a 19 year old who is using a piece of kit that is clever enough that it has bypassed 20, 30 years of my experience and got to the point where the flying is easy and natural. Um, and, uh, and I was very negative about it for, for some months. And then there came a point when I realized that Sure, you can fly a drone terribly easily. R really, children can do it. Um, there are things that you have to learn in order to call yourself an aviator, which I'm afraid you are because you're, you're sharing the same airspace as warm-blooded aviators. Um, so uh, that's all fine, but the vast majority had no idea how to create um, a, a shot through a drone. And that was when I found the motivation. Uh, we started doing little courses for, for people who wanted to, to film called Flying the Lens. And um, uh, one of the first uh, teams to come to us was um, an outfit, um, uh, a guy who owned the company, very keen, very good cameraman that he worked with. And, um, uh, and they had had problems uh, professionally. And when I watched them fly for 10 minutes, I could immediately see what the problem was. And I was drawing on uh, helicopter experience and particularly from the, the science of uh, cockpit resource management, where we learn, as you know, about the interaction between one pilot and another, or the interaction between a pilot and a cameraman and how you interact and 
who's leading at any given moment, which is not necessarily the pilot, not necessarily the captain. It's, it's, it's role dependent. And, um, uh, and with a couple of tweaks, we were able to, uh, to completely change the way that the two of them operated together. And they now have a very successful company. So I, I, that was the sort of quintessential realization moment where I went, you know what? After all this time, I perhaps have got something to offer. So what do you use them mainly for? I mean, you touched there on, on your training, um, but are you still shooting uh, commercials and film shots or are you just straight on the training now? No, neither, actually. I, um, it's been a time of great soul searching and I realised that I didn't want to <clears throat> um, go back to trying to do the same thing that I had done in helicopters. Um, I, it, here was a new tool. It required a certain amount of new skill. It certainly required a new headspace because my bottom was not in the flying machine. And that is, you know, that is quite a big uh, a change of your headspace. Uh, so I didn't really want to get back into the filming side. And also, you know, it, 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 there were early adopters who were doing by then tremendous work and still are to this day. And I, I really, really enjoy any time I see an aerial nowadays going, uh, is that a drone or is that a helicopter? And I can usually call it right, but the, the, the boundaries are seriously blurry now because the drone guys are getting pretty good. Um, and I, uh, I enjoyed the training, but I really wanted to get back to what I'd been doing in helicopters, which is generate a product. And having tried out all sorts of different directions and different uh, types of drone work, uh, the thing that I found fascinating was, was creating uh, 3D environments through photogrammetry, um, whether that's a landscape, uh, uh, whether it's a landscape for planning purposes or for agricultural purposes or whatever. Uh, and, and furthermore, I love uh, creating a three-dimensional uh, model of a, of a building, um, you know, perhaps a historic building or a, a, a building that is, you know, again, being looked at for renovation or planning. Um, and I just love the process uh, a bit like the helicopter time, you know, the helicopter time, you create the, 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 uh, the imagery in the air and you, you become much better at creating that imagery if you become an editor of your own material because you've only got to, you know, on a couple of occasions go, uh, I've got nothing to go between this shot and that shot, I've got no way of transitioning between the two things. And it sharpens you up for when you're capturing material to be certain that you do um, have the shot in the pan that, that, that's in your back pocket for that editing moment. And the same is true with photogrammetry, that, that, that I have loved the process, not quite trial and error, you know, I mean, I've done a lot of courses and a lot of study and, and looked at a lot of other people's material and you learn as much as you can, but it's never quite the same as, as doing it in the field. And I love the process of, uh, of capturing it well enough that you were able to come back and spend a very pleasurable day at the, in the edit suite, effectively, um, creating the 3D model, which is, is, is uh, the way that you want it to be. And that then led to an enjoyment of that latter part of the process just as much if not more than the capturing and so you know I'm, I'm quite often these days um uh people chucking me a couple of hundred bucks to uh, uh to assemble the material that they have shot in the field uh into a, a usable three-dimensional object and, and that way i get to kind of travel the world, I suppose. So where do you see uh, drones heading in the future? Of course, with this um, COVID-19 that's around the globe at the moment, uh, airline industry is struggling a little bit and um, a lot of the police force are using the, the drones more and more. Where do you see them fitting into society post this pandemic? Well, it's almost only limited by imagination, isn't it? Um, 
if uh, if five years ago you'd said to any of us that there will be drones flying around with, with passengers in unmanned drones with passengers in, uh, then uh, we'd have looked at you as if you're insane um, and now it's not only a real possibility it's probably just around the corner next year so I've been very privileged to uh, host or chair some of the significant drone meetings around the world and the, the one that I've done two years running is the European um, commercial UAV show uh, and chairing that is just uh, it's like Christmas really um, you know you have all of the, the, the great thinkers from the big companies the Airbus the, the, um, the Boeings the Bells um, you know I shared a stage for an hour with the uh, with the head of innovation at, at Bell Helicopters or Bell as they now call themselves and you get a, a glimpse into the future and the way that they're thinking and and how, how advanced they are, which is way beyond what gets reported some of the time. There are lots of things being tried uh, which will never happen, or they'll just wither on the vine. I think that some of the things that we enthuse about these days probably won't be around um, uh, at some point in the future, not very far away. And some things that we barely acknowledge at the moment uh, are serious game changers. Let me give you a very good example of that. The, you know, when they first started talking about delivery by drones of pizzas, and, and the, the media just became obsessed with pizzas. And you know, if you mentioned a drone, you had to talk about a pizza or a sausage. And, um, and I was like, oh, so fed up with hearing about this. Um, but then, you know, a slight tweak, and the medical profession in India discovered that they were losing most of their uh, transplant organs in traffic because they were sitting in ambulances that were sitting in traffic for three, four hours trying to cross the city. And they went, well, hang on a minute, we can program a drone to take off from this hospital and knows exactly where the other hospital is. And as it takes off, a text message is sent to the, to the nurse at the other end who's going to collect it from the roof. Um, and suddenly they've got fantastic success rate at, at transplant. That's the sort of delivery I can get enthused about. And, uh, and that's the kind of thing which is, um, which is going on now pretty much standard uh, and has developed outwards to the point where the, the first responders um, uh, at, a, at a road accident, for example, have the ability to make use of, of you know, limited use, but use of that kind of system where they do what they have to do and the drone does it what it has to do and returns the organ to the to, to the hospital but i think that we have to uh, um, keep an open mind and 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 probe and go not only is this particular purpose really valid but also go and is there a tiny tweak we could make that would take it into a whole other sphere mm. so I, I think that a, a lot of the things associated with drones uh, are about public perception and that's true from a, a, you know a, a, a DJI spark all the way up to a, a passenger carrying drone. Yeah it certainly is and that's that's something that I'm definitely keen on um, dispelling. Uh, a lot of people think that if a drone's in the air it's spying on you which you know um, you don't even have to have the camera switched on. There is a mistrust, uh, and we've got to get past that. And I think that, um, you know, I do a lot of, of keynote speaking and, and taking lessons that I've learned in aviation and applying them to, you know, corporate circumstances. And it's to do with leadership and perspective and all of those things. And, um, and a lot of the time it's about culture, because you and I know that, that the aviation industry uh, or aviators uh, have a culture and it's a culture that in, encompasses things like honesty and, and, and checklists and uh, all sorts of things um, and uh, and it's a culture that, that, that we're proud of and it's a culture that has um, the last hundred years in, incorporated into it and um, one of the things that uh, definitely needs to happen, and I, I believe it is happening now, is the, the um, 
embracing of uh, the people who are coming in to be aviators as drone pilots, embracing them and going, here is the culture that you've just joined. At the same time, there is a clash of cultures, and this is, you know, this uh, sort of uh, metaphor that I use for other things in, in my keynote speaking, but um, there is a clash of cultures between manned and unmanned aviators. And the manned aviators uh, were very suspicious of it at the start, and uh, you know, I've, I've spent my time kind of being a translator between the two worlds of, of, of manned and unmanned because there is a knee-jerk reaction by the manned aviators, and understandably so, and I had a certain amount of it myself, uh, where you go, why do I want to be sharing my airspace and my nice warm bottom uh, with a piece of metal which, if it goes through my blades, or more particularly my tail rotor blades or my, or my uh, jet um, intake, uh, has the chance to do me serious damage. So that's an understandable um, perspective problem. At the same time, the drone uh, facility are going, but we are the thing of the future, and you need to give us a bit of space here to operate and develop and expand. And both of those perspectives are right. Um, I like to talk about, you know, if I draw a six on a, on a table in front of you, you're sitting opposite me, you'll see a, a nine, and we are both entirely right, 100% right, that one sees a six and one sees a nine, which is called perspective. So we have this clash of cultures, um, and it's taking great effort by a lot of people to uh, find a way through that clash and to uh, not polarize it. And I think, by and large, uh, people throughout the, all professions um, around the world are doing a really, really good job of that. Um, uh, the air traffic management for, for um, uh, unmanned vehicles, it's getting pretty advanced now. Um, <clears throat> the uh, the ooh, shock horror, you know, drone just misses jet. Um, most times it, it's just a fallacy and we're kind of getting a bit bored with the with the media bringing that up it's like yeah don't tell me another story of that because the last 99 times it's out of 100 it's proved you wrong um so i think we're getting to a point where those two cultures are uh, if they're not living in harmony they are at least being reasonably respectful of each other I'm going right back to where you and i started I think it's about communication. I try to encourage anybody in the drone industry to spend, you know, one night a month at their local flying club or, or whatever it might be, going, look, here's a drone, feel it, touch it, have a go with it if you like, don't be afraid of it, and let's have a dialogue. Um, and I, I think that that is happening more and more. I think also that uh, manned aviation is saying to, to drone pilots, look, come and understand what our problems are. Um, and uh, so if we can get to a point where these cultures are interwoven and, and to an extent all part of one culture, then that will be the biggest uh, contribution that we aviators of today can make to what potentially happens tomorrow. Well, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for giving me your time today. And uh, I'm sure we'll catch up with you again um, as we create more series uh, for, for this RPAS TV. So, Jerry Grayson, thanks so much for your time. Thanks very much, Adidas. Really enjoyed it.